My name's Adrian. It's great to have some of you here in San Rafael Church. Uh, some are joining us on Zoom, uh, and maybe some catching up on YouTube later. A special welcome if you're visiting with us or it's your first time. Uh, it's fantastic uh, that you're able to gather with us as we worship God together. The reading this morning is taken from Ephesians 5, verses 1 to 14. Follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure or greedy person, such as a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the world, in the Lord, sorry. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, some of us were at uh, this thing called the Archdeaconry Synod this week, and uh, in among business meetings and other uh, talks, there's church services. And on the last evening, uh, Bishop David, who's retiring, um, he both led the service uh, and preached. Uh, and as he was sort of walking up the aisle, at the end of the service to sort of leave uh, the room, uh, someone's phone went off and said very loudly, I do not understand. To, uh, and everyone burst out and laughing. And sometimes I think each of us, when we leave church, you may feel that way, that I don't understand what's just gone on, or maybe it was in jargon that I didn't uh, understand. And my prayer is that today, that what we share and what we do uh, helps you engage with God in a significant way that you do understand what God is trying to say to you uh, through his words. But not only that you understand, but also that you act upon it. Uh, for those of you uh, who are not aware, we've been working uh, through the book of Ephesians. This time last year, we looked at the first three chapters, uh, and that was in a series entitled Transformed Life. But now that we've understood the transformed life we have in Jesus, that we have a new identity, a new purpose, a new belonging, we're now looking at the last three chapters in Ephesians about our transformed living, how God wants us to live in this new life of ours. In today's passage, Paul encourages us to follow our Heavenly Father's example by walking in love and light. The Greek word translated follow here is the word mementai, from which we get mime and mimic. In other words, he's asking us not just to follow after God in some general sense, but rather to imitate him. I don't know if you've noticed uh, that children naturally imitate their elders. American novelist and playwright James Bolt once said, Children have never been good at listening to their elders, but they've never failed to imitate them. 
And if that's the case, then we're, being asked, we're not being asked to do anything out of the ordinary. When we became Christians, we were adopted as children of God. And so Paul, all Paul is asking us to do here is that by the power of the Spirit is to grow in family likeness and to imitate the Father which we love. That's worth remembering as some of the things we're going to look at at this passage today can seem very challenging. Walking in love and light in this passage means walking in sacrifice and purity and being careful with our words. But by the power of the Spirit inside us, we can do it. We are His children following His example. And so here are three things that we can uh, glean from this passage as we seek to follow our Father's example and to walk in love and light. The first is to assess our attitude. As so often is the case, Paul doesn't begin by telling us what to do. Rather, he tells us why we should do it. In other words, he gives us some truth on which to me uh, meditate in order to shape our attitude before we go about our actions. Uh, maybe liken it this way, if you uh, were to go to a swimming pool and there's a sign asking everyone to shower before entering the pool. Essentially, it's saying that before you enter this larger body of water that is shared with everybody else, first go and wash your own body. And in the same way, before we dive into the do's and don'ts, we need, in a sense, to give our attitude a good wash. And all of this becomes a lot easier when we approach it in the right frame of mind. Much like having to do uh, those tasks around the house, they go a lot quicker when we get on and do it with a positive manner. Well, if we keep putting it off, if we keep complaining or grumbling about it, it never gets done. So have the mind of Christ in these things as we uh, look at today. And the key thing is that we should adopt this attitude of self-sacrifice. In verses 1 and 2 that Diana read to us, it says, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Uh, the word love in this verse is from the Greek agape, and it implies putting the other person first and sacrificing our needs and our desires. So let's follow Jesus' example and have this attitude of self-sacrifice. Sacrifice in biblical terms is, is a paradox. Jesus said, lose your life and you will gain it. And so our sacrifice might involve serving God in some way within a chaplaincy context. It may mean that you feel that you're called to lead or host a small group or, or help with children's ministry or, or something like that. And although these things can and often do uh, take personal sacrifice, believe me, it is so worth it when you serve God in these ways. I suppose it all comes down to the question of between you and God, who comes first? Now we come to the part of the verse that says, find out what pleases the Lord. The words find out invite us to do something. You see, sacrifice is proactive. If you think about it this way, in a marriage it's important to put the other person first. The way to a bad marriage is to concentrate on your own needs and only pick up your spouse's faults. Instead, we should find out what pleases the other person and have an attitude of gratitude about what they are and who they are. Jesus' sacrifice is not just an example to follow, but it's the ground on which we stand. If Jesus hadn't gone to the cross, we wouldn't be forgiven. In Luke 17, uh, between verses 11 and 19, Jesus, there's a story about Jesus healing 10 lepers. Only one of them comes back to thank him. 10%. Let's make sure our statistics are better and that we uh, thank God continually for all the ways in which he's blessed us. I heard of one Christian who, at the end of every day, wrote down in their journal everything that they were grateful for. 
So that's the, the why we should do these things. And now under the more specifics that Paul asks us to do. The first of them is to protect our purity. Verse 3 says, But among you there should not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. The first two words translated there, sexual immorality and impurity, cover all sexual interactions outside of marriage. In fact, the application goes beyond sexual immorality, but the context would suggest that this is Paul's main area of thinking. In the same way, the greed element here surely includes all forms of greed, but in context would definitely seem to evoke the commandment not to cover, covet someone else's wife. And it may seem strange at first to go from talking about walking in love to battling against impurity, but it's not strange at all. You see, Paul is encouraging us to be self-sacrificial because when we do that, then it means that we avoid its opposite, which is self-indulgence. Really, whatever else it is, sexual sin is self-indulgent. It's putting our own needs for gratification above the desires of others and the desires of God. So if we're to walk in love and in light, we have to have mastery over our bodies and over our purity. So how are we to remain pure? Well, there's great guidance here in what Paul says. He says there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality among you. Now that might sound harsh. Perhaps we think just a little sin will tide us over for a bit, maybe a bit like putting on a nicotine patch that just gives you a little hit, but it doesn't work like that. Paul's not being harsh here, but being helpful. And the way to avoid sexual immorality is to have nothing to do with it, to stay as far away from it as possible. Here's a, an illustration maybe to put that into some more context. Imagine uh, that some radioactive material is found in the field, the environmental agency come out and they decide that they can't move it. So first they put up one of those radiation tents to try and keep as much of the radiation from spilling out as possible. Then to keep things safe, they put a, a sort of perimeter fence, a high perimeter fence around it and they put a sign on the fence saying, do not enter. Now just say you're walking past that field, what would the sensible thing be for you to do? But perhaps uh, you're intrigued, perhaps you're tempted by the green glow of the radiation. Should you walk on by or should you climb over the fence to get a closer look? There's three reasons why you shouldn't climb over the fence. Firstly, it's wrong. There's a sign saying not to do it. Secondly, you could be in danger from radiation. And thirdly, if you were tempted enough to climb over the fence, what's to say that you won't be tempted enough to approach the tent? Sexual immorality is like this radiation. Keep away from it. Don't climb over the fence. So what is the radioactive temptation for you? Perhaps you're married and the temptation is another person. Maybe someone you work with and you think there's no harm in spending time with them. Maybe on some level you sense the Holy Spirit saying, stop, but you think it's okay, I can handle it. I could even lead them into a relationship with Jesus. You know what you're doing. You're climbing over that fence. Or perhaps the radioactive material for you is pornography. Perhaps you don't intend to look at it or even you go through a period where you don't. Then you think, maybe just before I go to bed, I'll, I'll have a quick look on my computer. You think it's no sin to go on your computer, you'll just have a look at some stuff. Maybe some movies, nothing bad, just a look. There's no sin at looking at your computer. But you know what you're doing. You're climbing over that fence. Or maybe it's a relationship, you're not married, you have no intention of sleeping together, but one of you has a free house. You, you go around one evening so that you can cuddle up on the sofa and watch a rom-com and get a little close. But what you're doing is climbing over the fence. 
So what if we have climbed over that fence? Maybe not even just climbed over the fence, but actually gone into the tent. Well, I'd encourage you to repent, to receive forgiveness, to have your purity restored, but also to resolve not to climb over that fence or any other fence again. Paul goes on to say, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light. So stay out of the darkness. We also find there a solemn warning for those who live in these dark deeds. Not those who stray momentarily and come back and have repentance, but those who live in darkness. And then in Ephesians 4, uh, verse 4, we read, nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. The third thing we must do if we're to walk in love and light is to watch our words. The three things we're encouraged to avoid here are mainly, but not exclusively, about the things that we say. With the first word, we're implored not to engage in obscene speech. The second word in the original Greek is the word from which we get the word moronic. It can just include a sort of low-level tittle-tattle, but in the context here would certainly include the more base types of sexual innuendo. And the third word translated as coarse joking is a word that could easily just mean witty in the original language. But again, it can have a negative connotation that this speech was designed to put someone else down. So in other words, Paul is saying that it's not simply about what we do with our bodies, but also the words that come out of our mouths. There's a notion here that our words are never just words, but rather they have power. The question is, do our words come from light or from darkness? Are we building others up with what we say or are we putting them down? Are we sullying the sacred gift of sex with dirty talk? Or are we putting down other people made in the image of God? Paul doesn't want us to be fooled into this way of thinking that it doesn't matter what we say. Our tongues can be used for darkness or they could be used for light. So how are we to use them well? Well, as it says in this passage, by giving thanks, just as I mentioned earlier. So the challenge for all of us this morning as we go in to a new week is to live as children of the light. Let's be pure. Let's use our words to build each other up. None of this is easy. And I often say that God doesn't condemn us for things that we've done in our past, but sometimes when we're, we get close to God, He, he challenges us. He uh, gives us uh, those inklings of the things that He wants us to put right in our lives. So nobody should leave this morning feeling condemned, but you may feel challenged. And God doesn't just leave us alone when He challenges us. He gives us His Holy Spirit so that we have the power and the strength to put right those things that He's maybe indicated to us that are wrong.